Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first session. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video showing kind of um, what the research funding agencies have done. Um, this morning, we are looking at the role of research funders in promoting gender equality, thinking about the achievements and the next step. And I'm really pleased that we have such a great panel here today to talk about you know, what they've been doing and what their thoughts are in terms of research funders. Uh, we will, first of all, be uh, hearing about the um, activities of the 4Gen community of practice and the achievements and lessons learned so far. Uh, then we will discuss the role that research funding organisations have in promoting institutional change uh, with research performing organisations, thinking about their current action, their priority areas, and how they promote institutional change through gender equality plans. Uh, and finally, we will be asking our panelists to think and reflect on new and emerging topics mm. to be tackled in the new era, including their needs as research funders and the, cha and the challenges that they face. Um, our panel today, just as a reminder, we have full biographies of each of our speakers on the conference website. Um, our panel today, we have Rita Simperman from the Research Council of Lithuania, uh, Rochelle Fritsch from Science Foundation Ireland in Ireland, Moa Persdotter from Vinova in Sweden, Marius Mitroy from the Executive Agency for Higher Education, Research, Development, Innovation Funding in Romania, Enrique Blayan from the State Research Agency of the Government of Spain, and Astrid Zubier from the Dutch Research Council from the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Rachel Fritsch to talk about um, the 4Gen Community of Practice. Really pleased that she's presented this. This has emerged from the Act, Gen Act on Gender Project, which is another Horizon 2020 funded project, which I've been involved with. So very pleased to hand over to Rochelle to kick off the session. Rochelle. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk about Forgin. So I'm Rochelle Fritsch. I work as the Forgin facilitator and also a scientific program manager in Science Foundation Ireland. So first, I will just talk a little bit about the ACT project. So Forgin is part of the ACT project, which is a Horizon 2020 project that focuses on developing and promoting communities of practice to advance knowledge, collaboration, collaborative learning, institutional change, and gender equality in the European research area. And the ACT project actually developed these eight different communities of practice uh, in, in different subject areas and in different regional uh, areas within Europe. So Forgen is focusing on funding organizations. So what is the Forgen community of practice? Well, we're a community so supporting knowledge sharing and best practice within research and funding, uh, within research and innovation funding agencies. So we're committed to the goal uh, of monitoring and improving the implementation of gender equality in the research and in, in research and innovation in the European research area and beyond. So we're bringing together gender equality practitioners in funders to promote knowledge sharing and best practice. And we have members from a range of different funders throughout Europe and beyond. And you can see there's a, a wide variety there in, in the logos. So why focus on research funding? Well, researchers play a critical role in addressing gender equality in the research and innovation landscape. Equal opportunities in research are linked to success rates and participation in research funding. Evaluation and success of research grants is critical to the success of a researcher, which in turn promotes their, uh, affects their promotional opportunities. And funders must ensure that decision-making, the grant evaluation process, and all of our post-award processes support gender equality throughout all our activities. So a little bit more about what we're focusing on in the 4Gen community of practice. We, we uh, work together to develop four, five different areas of focus within the community. The first one we focused on reducing bias in the grant evaluation process. That's part of our core business as research funders and is a really important component of the community. We focused on intersectionality. So how, um, how to make sure that we are looking at equality, diversity, and inclusion, as well as gender and kind of expanding that scope. We looked at the sex and gender dimension and research and innovation to make sure that uh, the sex and gender dimension is accounted for in our funding processes. We focused on le leadership and sustainability. So ensuring that um, you know, we have leadership, uh, that we, we think about gender equality, 
and decision making in our own organizations and sustainability of when, within our own organizations and throughout the community of practice. And last, we focused on collecting and monitoring gender equality data, which is the core to making sure that you can implement gender equality actions within your organization. So I'll talk a little bit about how we've dealt with this within the community. One of the first things that we did uh, as a community was mapped out the grant evaluation, mapped out the, the process of each of these five areas um, through the grant evaluation process to really dig into how we do our processes and, and what are the knowledge gaps. And I'll, I'll, I'll show a, slight, a small demonstration uh, in one of these areas, focusing on reducing bias in the grant evaluation process. So part of the mapping process was to try to define a common language between all of the funding organizations working together. And we came up with this general map of the grant evaluation process with these stages. So initiation, launch, the, the you know, processing of applications, the assessment, decision-making, monitoring, and evaluating our programs. And I'll, I'll talk you through how we did the mapping in, in this one area. So first we focused on figuring out what kind of actions we've done throughout our organizations. So for example, language review for linguistical bias in the initiation stage, requiring uh, gender equality plans for eligibility of our, fund, of our research performing bodies, you, some of our funders are putting together narrative CVs like to, to, to look at the door principles. Blinding of gender for applicants is another area. You could use unconscious bias videos for reviewers. Gender balance of review panels, you know, ensuring gender balance and review panels. We looked at the idea of uh, what bias could be introduced between structured interviews versus free interview formats. Um, if you use independent gender experts as observers within your panels, how to monitor gender balance in the project phase. And then on top of that, we, 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 this is only a, a, small, a small portion of what was our brainstorming and where we figured out, but we, we looked at also the knowledge gaps that we, we had and we focused on those. So when we looked at reducing bias in the grant evaluation process, one of the knowledge gaps we did find while working together is around narrative CVs, which a lot of research funders are introducing. But this new method to evaluate researchers has an unknown bias. It's never been really focused on before. So this work led to a workshop in collaboration with the DORA funders group at looking at the way we're, we can assess researchers. This workshop is planned for the end of September and it's open to all funding agencies. And we have a we're gonna focus on the potential bias of narrative CVs and how we might mitigate these. And we're gonna have experts in the field of bias and, and how to evaluate people. So that's one output that's going to happen very soon. And, and we'd love all of the funders around Europe to join us. We'll be sending out some invitations. Another area of focus was the sex and gender dimension in research. And here, uh, the working group has focused on gathering practices from members they looked at common successes and challenges and have found gaps in the knowledge. And solutions to these gaps in the knowledge will be the focus of a workshop in September with Professor Londa Scheibinger. And that workshop is on the 21st of September and it will also be open to all funding agencies. So by, by putting us our, our, our different knowledge together, we have been able to find these gaps in the knowledge and really focus on what needs to be known. And a lot of that um, has to do with monitoring and evaluation in this, in this area of the sex and gender dimension, but I'm sure that uh, Moa from Vanova will help explain that a little bit more because uh, Vanova are leading that working group. Another area of focus has been the collecting and monitoring of gender equality data. So this working group has focused on developing a new module for the GM survey tool, which is a tool that's been developed in the ACT project. Um, and we're looking at specifically uh, defining a module for funding agencies. So this new survey module will allow funders to benchmark themselves against each other. We're also producing a policy brief, which includes a business case for collecting and monitoring gender equality data, as well as frequently asked questions. And we're aiming for this to help assist the funders who are starting on this process and, and help them and define what kind of gender equality data they need to collect at different stages in implementing. And hopefully this will help funders decide what data they need to collect for their gender equality plans. 
Because of the COVID pandemic, we were able to pivot our work very quickly and focus on COVID-19. And there are a lot of gender equality issues in COVID-19, and there's a lot of equality issues to do with research funding in, in, in this. And so at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in April 2020, we were able to run a workshop which integrated that, which looked at integrating the sex and gender dimension in the COVID-19 calls that our funders were running. We also looked at the potential effects of COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic on our research communities and how we might potentially mitigate this bias. In December, we followed up with another open workshop with uh, funders from around Europe, and we focused on these areas again to try to, to find best practice and, and try to brainstorm of how we can really mitigate these biases as, as the pandemic developed. And, and we have some, uh, we had a really good, uh, some really good actions that could be uh, implemented and, and we feel that we could work together more on this. So what's the benefit of working within a community of practice? Well, you have a strong network of international practitioners working on a common goal together. So in this case, gender equality and research funding. You ha we have had access to international experts through the, this field, through the ACT project, but also by having this larger group, we have more pull and we're able to draw on expertise in a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way than if you were just working on your own within your funding agency. We've been able to de develop a common understanding and language around gender equality and research funding, as well as sharing on the ground practice. In, in what we're doing on the ground. So sometimes when we talk about policies, you're talking at a very high level, but the devil is in the detail when it comes to bias. So actually talking to colleagues, you find out that some of the on the ground practices are quite specific and that's really important for gender equality. And giving uh, that network and that, that um, open community where we can talk really frankly about our challenges together, we're able to really talk about that detail. In addition, we've been able to rapidly adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, upcoming uh, emerging event, uh, emerging issues. And that's been really beneficial for, for our members. So what's next? Well, we're coming to the end of the ACT project and we need to look for new opportunities for the community to, to move on. And we'd love to scale up by adding new members and, and, uh, and move on in, in Europe and work with a bigger group. We could expand the areas of focus. We had um, a limited amount of time in the Forgen project, so we didn't get to do everything that we wanted to. So for example, I think um, specific uh, support for funders in developing gender equality plans. We've looked at the different areas, but not combined that into, into specific uh, guidance. We didn't have a, an opportunity to work on gender-based violence, but that's a really important topic. And also, we, we have the bigger scope of looking at all monitoring and evaluation of gender equality actions and gender equality plans is something that is a bigger topic that hadn't been tackled. So those are some ideas for what's next. And I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to talk about the, the Forgen Community of Practice. The website is there. And uh, of course, we're funded by Her the Horizon 2020 uh, program of research and innovation as part of the ACT project. Thank you, Rochelle. And Rochelle, it would be perfect to be the I was just going to say. Thank you very much for that, that quick overview of the Borgen project. Um, it, it's, it's so great to see how much has developed since the start of the app project. Um, I think, like all European projects, we've been delayed um, because of COVID 19, and it's great to see how much has emerged. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that you know, you're looking at inviting research funders from across Europe to join the various workshops so please you know we'll be very interested in, in learning more about how that progresses um, and, and I think you reflected you know on, on the importance of these communities of practice one of the one of the things that we discussed yesterday was the importance of kind of EU level discussion kind of mutual exchange and cross learning from each other um, and also really pleased to see kind of thinking about upcoming topics around gender-based violence. Um, I think we had initial discussions yesterday about the roles of the role that we need to play in terms of ensuring the safety of our researchers, you know, as we think about mobility, as we send, you know, young researchers across Europe, you know, across the world and making sure that they, we have safe spaces for people to work. So thank you very much for that overview. Um, I'm going to ask now, move now into kind of having kind of initial thoughts from each of our panelists uh, about the role of uh, research funding organizations in promoting institutional change around gender equality. And here I'm going to turn to Reda Superman first from the um, Research Council of Lithuania. Reda. 
Thank you, Gary Luke. I would like to give a short overview about situation uh, in Lithuania. So since uh, 1998, we have a law on equal opportunities for women and men. Since, since 2005, we launched the national program on equal opportunities for women and men. Uh, it calls for four or five years projects. And in 2008, strategy of women and men's equal opportunities in science appeared. And in 2011, 13, we implemented the national project uh, promotions on, of gender equality in science. On ground of the project results, we update the strategy of women's and men's equal opportunities in science. And in 2015, a recommendation for ensuring equal opportunities for men and women in Lithuania science and study institution we are prepared. And in 2016, law on the approval, entry into force and implementation of the labor code appeared. Here we have an article on employee gender equality and non-discrimination on other grounds. And um, now I briefly will tell about the Research Council of Lithuania, which uh, has been founded in 1991 to fulfill the role of an expert institution tracking the challenges of science development on national level. Exactly today we are celebrating 30th anniversary. So, and since 2007, the Research Council of Lithuania has been committed to be the main research funding body that provides competition-based funding for the research in Lithuania. Another important of our task is related to science advice. The council has served as an advisory body on research policy to Lithuania parliament and the government. The Council also takes responsibility for the fostering transnational and international cooperation in research and innovation by supporting bilateral programs as, as well as participation in AU framework programs. So currently, we are discussing preparation of gender equality plan very intensely. The aim of the Gender Equality Plan of the Research Council of Lithuania is to ensure equal opportunities for all men and women researchers. We proceed from the principles of gender equality in all our activities, but without comprom uh, compromising on the competence and quality. We wish uh, to support researchers in Lithuania in, in respectively of gender, as well as sexual orientation, nationality, age, and other individual characteristics, and believe that research will be benefit to society uh, the most uh, if the background of research is involved in conducting research is as diverse as possible. And uh, if the aspect of the gender has also been taken into account. Uh, the current uh, stage of the gender equality in Lithuania has not reached the equality of men and women in terms of their position and opportunities. Uh, there exists a great gender imbalance and across academic position and the proportion of women in decision making bodies and regarding the research policy in smaller still. And uh, considerably more men apply for and receive grants than women. In order to improve the indicator of gender equality, it's imperative to take uh, the issue systematically. The aim of the Research Council of Lithuania is to pay more attention to the aspects of the gender in all our activities. Research Council are proceeding from the activities and the possibilities to improve the status of gender equality. Uh, we have five main objectives which we, uh, uh, for the next time of period 2027, 2021, 2027, so it will be raising gender awareness among the employees and among the members of the panels and members of the council, council adhering the principles of equal treatment, improving gender balance among the members of the panels, committees, and among the reviewers, improving gender balance <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, of the applicants and recipients of the research grants, awards, and funding, and of course, implementing a gender-sensitive com uh, communication strategy. 
As well, last year, the Research Council of Lithuania, UNESCO, and Dream Project organized online meeting of new consultation group based in Lithuania, which brings together research and innovation system experts. The experts examine the self-assessment requirements under the UNESCO recommendations for science and scientific researchers. 195 uh, countries signed up the treaty, among them also Lithuania making these uh, standards truly global. The treaty covers all principles of responsible research, ethic, open science, team, education, public engagement, and gender equality. It was a good opportunity to ask ourselves questions about Lithuania science now and in the future. And it's a great occasion to reflect and uncover what is done well and should be emphasized in the first our gender equality plan of Research Council of Lithuania. So thank you, Karis, this is uh, from my side, Paul. Thank you, Reda, and congratulations to the Research Council of Lithuania on their 30 year anniversary. Um, thank you. I think what, what you described are, I guess, some of the common challenges we see with research funders in terms of the imbalance of applicants, the imbalance of you know, reviewers, the imbalance in committee structures. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, I, I, I'm a member of the General Project Commission to this, this National Science Foundation, and we discuss similar issues about how do we start to address some of these things and think about you know, research funding in that space. So thank you for, for sharing your, your experiences with us. Um, I'm going to come back to Rochelle again now. So Rochelle, I mean, you talked about the forging community, but could you give us a perspective from Science Foundation Ireland about you know, what, what you think the you know, research funders should do to, to promote institutional change? Of course. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background from, I guess, uh, the Irish perspective, because I think we've been working in Ireland um, at, a, at a level, at a higher level. So in, in Ireland, we have a, a national gender action plan for higher education. And, and that action plan actually has uh, actions for each of the funding agencies as well. And one of the things that we found has worked really well is to uh, have that action plan. And then one of the major actions was to um, to introduce an eligibility criteria for all research performing bodies that we fund to have an Athena Swan uh, certification in a specific timeline. So I guess a little bit of background, Athena Swan would be kind of similar to having a gender equality plan. It's a, a little bit more robust process than just a simple gender equality plan as it's evaluated by um, international experts. And, and if, uh, if the institutions have a robust enough plan, they can actually get a bronze award. So, all of the funding agencies within Ireland, um, all the major ones, uh, SFI, IRC, uh, the HRB, which is Health Research Board, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, all of us require uh, our research performing bodies to have a Athena Swan qualification, a bronze and a silver in a specific timeline. And that started back in 2015. It really was a, a big movement that drove institutional change within the within the universities and other research performing bodies. As a funder, sometimes we can't reach in and change culture. And we found this is one of the most effective ways that's changed culture. So as a funder, we have, um, we have a special area of privilege because we can actually affect uh, the eligibility requirements of our research performing bodies. So we were thinking in future, you know, we could do the same thing if we, we required specific types of policies around sexual harassment or uh, harassment and bullying. That's a way that we could use that in future. Another, another area that we've been focusing on is really looking at our portfolio and seeing if, if different programs have an imbalance of either uh, gender balance in the applicants or at the word stage. And we've been specifically focusing on developing gender actions to either target the number of women applying to the calls and the number of women being successful within the calls. And, and we've actually uh, launched a, a, a new call called the Frontiers for the Future program, where we worked on both of those. From analyzing the data from previous calls, we realized we had an issue with both application rates and success rates. So to encourage women to apply, we really looked at our language and we developed our language within the call to make sure it was gender neutral. Um, and then we, uh, we made sure to promote uh, the call and, and, and make sure that we, the community understood that we were looking for strong women candidates. We actually got an increased application rate from our previous calls from about 20% to 36% women which is uh, the amount of uh, women in, in the pool, for our, our potential applicant pool in Ireland. Um, in addition to this, we, we included a, um, an action where if 
the final scores were tied, we would advance the women before the men. Um, but the, you know, all of the applicants uh, were put through the same rigorous uh, evaluation process. Um, if you looked at the success rates of our previous calls compared to the Frontiers for the Future call, we had about 21% uh, success uh, for applicants who were women in the previous calls. And in this call, we had 45% of the awards to women. So these are some strong actions that we've been working on and just a, a brief taster of, of how a funder can really affect change within, within, um, within the research community and in the country you're working in. Thank you so much for that overview, Rochelle. Um, it's great, great to hear the kind of role Athena Swan has played. Um, in my previous life, I used to work on the Athena Swan program. So, um, and you know, from the kind of UK perspective, we've seen how, I guess, conditionality of funding attached to, um, I guess, a gender award or certification has really pushed forward um, gender equality. Um, my screen. I'm going to move over to our third speaker. Um, apologies, I think my internet connection dropped there slightly, so I'm not sure if I dropped out of screen. So I was saying, um, I'm going to move over to our third speaker now, um, who is uh, Moa uh, Pearce Dotter from Vinova. Moa, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Yes, my name is Moa Pearce Dotter, and I work as a program administrator within gender equality and AI at Vinova. And Vinova is the Swedish innovation agency. And in our role, we work to identify, mobilize, and finance projects that strengthen Swedish innovation capacity. And in that work, uh, we finance uh, around 3 billion annually in innovation and applied research. So in this work, gender equality is, of course, a critical work. And we have a core team, which I am a part of at Vinova, working with gender equality and making sure that this is a part of our definition of sustainable innovations. And what we mean with that is that we are, um, we are fostering collaboration between all sectors and making sure that we, or at least trying to make sure that we have an equal number of women and men uh, regarding applicants, but also that we uh, divide the financing and the funds that we uh, promote in the research innovation area across both women uh, and men uh, fields. And right now we are trying to uh, create a new framework at Vinova because we are, we are working with gender mainstreaming our whole core process from uh, communication regarding our calls and our criteria to how we put together assessment boards, both regarding having equal assessment board teams, but also regarding having um, gender expertise in these boards. And then also regarding the evaluations. But since um, the, the Swedish government has put a lot of effort in trying not, not just to focus on, um, on gender equality, but also at diversity, this is something that we have on our table right now. And, and it's also part of the Agenda 2030 uh, framework. So we are also working on a new uh, gender equality action plan um, according to the updated mandate uh, and assignment from the Swedish government. And uh, it, is, it is hard to, uh, to uh, work with gender equality and it's even harder to broaden uh, the perspective regarding diversity and inclusion. But with that said, it's uh, also very important and it's a task that we take on uh, very seriously and that it's, it's a need to have this integrated in the research and innovation. Um, so what we do at Vinova, we are um, trying to be part of, of the institutional change by fixing the knowledge and working with different toolbox that we can uh, promote to our funded projects um, so that they can work with a, with a norm critical innovation process within the projects. And by so we, we uh, ensure that we get diversity, not just within the team, but within um, the fields of innovation and, and who the innovations are made for. We also take an active part in international collaborations, such as Forgen. Uh, and as Rochelle mentioned, uh, Vinova is, the, is leading the working group on sex and gender dimension in research and the workshop with Landa regarding gender innovations. And I hope to talk to more about that in the part two of this, um, of this conference. But um, what we can see is that even though uh, a lot of 
great things are happening and we are moving forward, there is a need of, of ownership regarding these questions and mandate and budgets at all research um, funding agencies. Because we will, when we want to have it integrated in everything we do, um, but we also need to have a strong mandate because this is something that needs to be worked with every day. Um, and we cannot uh, ever think that it, if we integrate it, it will, it will automatically uh, work fine. We need to have these core teams, these strong international collaborations uh, and making sure that uh, gender equality is uh, something that we in the future have by default in everything uh, we do, but we are not there yet. Um, so at Winova, we are trying to also at the same time working with, with new kinds of way in changing the perspectives in how we are giving out uh, funding. So something that I look forward to and that I hope that I can uh, invite you all to uh, in, uh, in communicating is that we will during the autumn have a hackathon where we can see, uh, where, we, we, where we will try to see if we can use AI in promoting gender equality and to show awareness and, and shred lights at the commercial potential to use AI in promoting gender equality. So that's a little bit about uh, Vinova and what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you Mo, for that. Um, it, it, it actually reminded me yesterday, the, the commissioner, Maria Gabriel, said, um, you know, talked about the importance about thinking of the missing core per perspectives of, of gender in innovation, in disruptive technologies, how we really need to accelerate that, um, you know, thinking about what, what skills we look at, enterprise, entrepreneurship, how do we build gender and sex analysis into, you know, into innovation. So it's really timely that you'll be thinking about that at Vinova. Um, and the hackathon sounds fascinating in terms of, of using AI to promote gender equality. I think, you know, one of the discussions that is often had is how AI is, is biased sometimes in terms of, you know, there's gender bias in AI. So it'd be really interesting to see that. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to our next speaker, who is Marius. Uh, Marius Mitroy from the Executive Agency for Education, Research Development and Innovation Funding from Romania. Hello, and, uh, and thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to all the, all the speakers. I think that I'm learning so much uh, <laughs> right now, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great experience to be here. So thank you for that. Now, uh, as the, a bit of background information about, about us, we are the research uh, and innovation funding agency in Romania. We also fund higher education and uh, work on different uh, policy support uh, regarding research and innovation. And um, now going back to, to our subject, um, we are working for more than a year now to, uh, for a gender equality plan. Uh, and we also have an internal core team uh, that is actually trying to solve the challenges that come with, with this subject. And I'm also part of it. Um, so we, we developed a gender equality plan within a Caliper project, which is also a project funded by uh, the European Commission. Um, and we are now trying to uh, finalize it and, and, and implement it. So, and, and we do have, uh, say, two main directions. One is our internal uh, you know, uh, approved gender equality plan. Um, and also the, um, say, to create a best practice for our uh, research um, performing organization that we actually fund. Uh, but we don't want to limit it to that and also want to push it to our partners, stakeholders, and uh, every uh, institution that we actually work with. So uh, as far as we know, uh, we are the first public body in Romania to develop and implement a gender equality plan. Uh, and this is why we want to create a best practice example to, to all, of, all of our partners. Um, now we are on, we are kind of lucky uh, that it, because we don't have uh, strong issues uh, within our organization, but on the other half uh, part, we do have a challenge. And this is a challenge itself because um, since people have a hard time understanding the long-term benefits of this kind of initiative, just because they don't face it on day, day, day by day basis. Uh, so, as an overall objective, we want to strengthen the gender equality within our institution uh, to create a gender equality culture. Actually, 
using you know methodologies and uh, different protocols and a lot of uh, informative materials. Uh, but the uh, um, overall end is to foster the gender equality mindset within uh, our uh, stakeholders and the many people that we, we, we fund. Now, uh, j just to tell you a bit about how we actually uh, worked on develop, uh, developing our gender equality plan, uh, we had a lot, a lot of discussions, interviews, focus groups, um, internal and also external with our stakeholders, because we wanted to see how they can perceive us from this point of view. Uh, we also tried to uh, analyze uh, our funding procedures uh, and how can we use, um, you know, gender ne neutral in our, uh, in our text because uh, at some point we thought that they were okay. Uh, and we actually discovered that uh, we can do better. <laughs> uh, just to, to, to be mild on that. Um, now our actual plan has pro procedures and processes for the human resources department, for the internal communication, uh, and for our actual funding instruments. And this, I think it's a great period to start just because it's a new financial period and we can easily uh, you know, change the, the funding instruments that we, that we manage. Now, I, I don't want to, to take a lot of your time because there is a lot to discuss about it. And it's, it's a really, really interesting subject, uh, but thank you for having me here. And I actually look forward to, to learn from all your experiences uh, as, as far as I see you have a lot. So thank you for that. Thank you, Marius, for that. I think I think we're always learning. All of us are always learning. Just listening to this and yesterday, I've learned so much from you know what different you know countries are doing, what different member states are doing, what different research funders are doing. Um, but similarly, you know, you describe common challenges that you have about you know gender sensitive language, you know, gender neutral language. What you know, how do we present? You know, what do research funders say? What does it? You know, what what do research funders encourage by the language they use? Um, so you know, these are important challenges that I think you know, I look forward to discussing with, with the panel shortly as well. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Enrique Payan from uh, the State Fund Research Agency of the Government of Spain. Hello. Yes, I would like to discuss a few of the aspects that we are working on or, or currently implementing in, with regards to gender equality. In fact, in our agency, we are currently implementing our first gender equality plan since the beginning of the year. And there's a number of activities going on around it. The first activity is the review of documents and the streamlining of the new documents for gender equality. This has been done already for the most part in the core documents of the agency, but we continue to do it on the new calls for proposals and evaluation and monitoring reports. And we're trying to introduce systematically the gender equality perspective. In training, we run a yearly uh, training activity for the personnel of the agency in relation to research funding activities. And actually it's a course that has pretty good demand and, and it's turning out real well. At the same time, our main area of activity to ensure that proposals are funded uh, under the principles of gender equality, we are running training and self-training evaluation uh, activities for our the evaluation managers and for the evaluators. With regard to the evaluators, this self-training is really uh, time constrained, right? Because evaluators are real busy people and we need to uh, compress all the information that we need to, to give them before the beginning of the evaluation. Regarding the evaluation itself, we are promoting uh, gender equality in evaluators and evaluation managers. So, and uh, we are within the bounds of the 40-60%. And we are also at the agency analyzing proposals which declare gender-related research contents. We also have a scientific area for uh, gender-related topics and um, and which grants its own uh, projects, right, on, on this topic. And regarding reporting, we do reporting on, on gender uh, participation, gender funding, uh, and disaggregated data on, on, on sex for, uh, for participation and leadership in our grants. And we're publishing reports 
with gender disaggregated data on the resolution of the main calls for proposals. And that is in a nutshell what we're currently doing. Over to you, Gary. Thank, thank you, Enrique. And you know, it sounds, it sounds similar, you know, you're looking at the kind of gender balance, thinking about training for personal. I think we've talked about, you know, the different things that research funders can do in terms of training your panelists, training your, you know, your evaluators and so on. So thank you for sharing that overview. Um, and lastly, but not least, for this first bit, um, Astrid. I'm going to hand it to you, Astrid Zubier from the Dutch Research Council. Yes, thank you, Gary. And thank you for the invitation to present uh, what we are doing uh, at NWO in the Netherlands. Uh, lots, yeah, I, I, I'm the last one and, and lots of things have already been said. Uh, we, are, we also do lots of things uh, on gender mainstreaming. So we have screened the whole pro uh, process and, um, but I only have three minutes. So I will uh, just uh, focus on a, a few aspects on our core process. On a, our and then on a national level and on the target groups. Um, what we do have, uh, on our core process, our, the, the, our, we are an RFO. So what we do is evaluation of research and researchers. And uh, we, have, we are just about to finish um, the production of a, a training against uh, bias and then it's biased uh, not gender bias, but bias. I mean, we, our focus is the, the, the broad diversity um, range of uh, diversity uh, aspects. So it's about seniority, about uh, sex, gender, uh, about um, disabilities, about et ethnicity, etc. So we, we, we take it all in. And uh, the, the training we developed is against bias. Um, the training consists of a video, and um, and the video is actually part of the training. All our uh, policy members are at this moment being trained, and this is going to be mandatory to be able to guide uh, a grant or an um, or evaluation committee. So all our policy officers have to have followed this training. And also uh, the video is used as a training tool to all our committee members and the referees we ask to uh, evaluate research. So we really implement this video in our system. And I think uh, what is also nice to mention is that we, will, we are going to use the, train, the, the trainer principle because we think that, but we are convinced that um, bias training and knowledge about preventing bias is a, a critical knowledge for us as evaluators of research. Uh, so we really want to internalize this, this knowledge and uh, I'm going to be a trainer myself and I am going to train in the future all the policy, policy officers and, and in that way we also will deepen our knowledge on this. So this is one aspect I would like to, to present here as a, hopefully a good practice. Uh, then on the national level, um, we have since September uh, last year, we have a um, national action plan on diversity inclusion in higher education and research. And with the plan, um, there is also a committee. And this committee is uh, composed in a very, very diverse way. So. You can think of any diversity aspect, it's represented in this committee. Um, and it's really useful because we, when we have some, well, we all the time have themes and, and questions and we can, we can use this committee to, to, to think with us, what, how, what do you think? And, and it's really uh, you know, very rich in, in ideas and it prevents our tunnel vision. Uh, and I think from, from a national point, it's it's also nice to know that we, to, to develop this national action plan, we have formed a national coalition of the, the, the most important partners. And that's also very nice to have, to know the people at the universities, at the RFOs, but also in, in education, to, to uh, for intervention, for instance. Now, at this moment, uh, this committee is uh, looking at uh, data and monitoring on a national level because we need the data, we are hunger, we are hungry for data on diversity in science. Uh, and they have just uh, published a guide 
for Dutch uh, RFOs and, and uh, RPOs to uh, develop a gender equality plan. So there's some cohesion in how the way we are going to develop those plans in the Netherlands, thanks to this committee. Uh, and also in the part of this plan is that we as an RFO are going to look into the, the pros and cons of uh, Tina Swan ch Charter. So we're going to do this in the future, it's part of the plan. So this is on the, on the national level. And then to end this very short presentation, I would like to uh, look at the target groups uh, we focus on at the moment. And these are two target groups, uh, women in STEM and uh, research, Dutch researchers uh, with a migration background. For women in STEM, we have um, uh, we, we now have on a yearly basis extra positions in our talent program. So just to 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 enrich the system because we lack, you know, there are already too too few female students in STEM. So we really have to 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 uh, enrich uh, the academic uh, scenery, and so we we have extra positions for junior researchers and hopefully they stay <laughs> in research and then uh, we in June there we have uh, broadcast a series of uh, webinars for uh, women in STEM about barriers they in, in, engage and we had 400 we are a small country and we had uh, 400 people who actually uh, watched uh, the, the webinar. So it was, uh, we think it, we were, it was a success. We are going to repeat it. We have prizes for diversity. And we have a scheme for women in STEM who are risk to drop out for financial reasons. So we try to keep them in the system and uh, keep the pipeline going. That is for the women in STEM. And then for the migration background, uh, we are about to launch a, a, a call, uh, especially for Dutch um, Dutch researchers, junior researchers with a migration background. Uh, we have a scheme for fugitive researchers, so uh, researchers who are now live in the Netherlands uh, but have fled from their home countries. And uh, the, um, the reactions to this program is the, the, the yeah is, is great. The researchers in the Netherlands they, they feel that with hiring uh, such a, um, a researcher from, from, from those countries, uh, they get, really get new perspectives and they fit well in the team. And it, yeah, it's a really positive experience to have this program. Uh, and then last but not least, next year, we're going to launch a call for universities uh, to enable them to do research about how they can uh, provide an environment for people with a migration background to feel at home in their universities. So this is quite new. So it is about research, but it's a very applied way of research. And it's really the research that university have to do together. So they, they need to turn in an application with at least one other university. And so we, we make sure that they can learn about how, how do we provide this culture? How can we change the culture where those do young people with a migration background need to keep them in the system and to, to get them enthusiastic to um, pursue um, an academic career. So these were the three, three things I would like to present here, but uh, we do, well, I think we do it all. <laughs> but for now, these are the, the most important things we have done for the last two years or so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, I, I think that final point you made about culture it's probably the most important one to think about for many of us. Um, you know, what, what is research culture? Uh, I mean, here in the UK, we've had lots of discussions about the, the toxic research culture, bullying and harassment in research, you know, the pressure to, to bring in research grants, you know, the kind of homogenous research groupings because, you know, people, you know, um, you, there, there's very little diversity in some of our research groups. So, you know, what you're doing sounds really interesting about bringing in new perspectives um, from people with kind of migration backgrounds and making sure that they feel included in, in that research culture. Uh, so the first question I have, um, a, a number of, I have a number of questions actually. So I, I'm going to start, I think you talked about Athena Swan as well, Astrid, and, and so did Rochelle in terms of the impetus for Science Foundation Ireland and for the Dutch Research Council. Um, is There is an EU-wide project, uh, the CASPER project, which is looking at the possibility of a gender equality certification um, for across Europe. 
Um, and, and I guess the question is, do you think that's a desirable thing um, across Europe? And do you think it would help to, you know, to, to give you a kind of benchmark on, and uh, should research funders be looking at that? Should they be linking to some kind of standard? Um, any of my panelists, please. Um, your, your initial thoughts about, you know, it, should, you, should you have conditionality of funding to, to an instrument like that? We are about to start thinking about those kind of instruments, so it's it's quite hard to say anything. Uh, what I've what I've really thought through, but I, I guess that Rochelle can uh, the, an island is more uh, experienced with those kinds of um, schemes. So maybe Rochelle can uh, can give an uh, el can el elaborate on this. I think it would be very beneficial to not just have an eligibility requirement for a gender action, uh, equality plan, but also have that plan evaluated to find out if it is um, a good quality one. And I mean, the Athena Swan um, initiative it is a way to do that. I guess um, from, from uh, an implementation point of view, it would be really great to have a common uh, way to evaluate how successful those plans are being implemented. So not just having a plan, but making sure that you see impact. We don't want these gender equality plans that are mandatory for eligibility for research funding and Horizon Europe to be a tick box exercise. We want them to actually um, change culture and really promote institutional change. And I think by just having a plan up on your website doesn't necessarily do that, but having it evaluated under a system that would be similar to the Athena Swan system, you know, where the bronze award, you get, um, you've shown that you've developed a good plan from your data, evidence-based plan. The silver shows that you've actually had impact in gender equality, both uh, in, in data and in your culture. I think that that's really required to make sure this isn't a tick boxing exercise that we actually see change. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, any thoughts from other speakers? So, um, may I? Sure, of course, Mary, please go ahead. Uh, so, I, I actually do have mixed feelings about this certification uh, because, sure, it will be easier for us as funding bodies to look for a certification just to, to have that. And uh, that may, be, can, may become a checkbox at some point. Uh, but the, actually, my main concern about this is we are trying to cut red tape you know, as much as possible. Wouldn't this actually increase it? Uh, and, uh, and another certification that, that you know, research for a performing organization should go through to actually be allowed or ac uh, be allowed access to, to funding. I mean, uh, sure, as long as it's done right uh, in, the, in the proper way, uh, it should be okay but trying to have a uh, European policy that will be um, differently understood and implemented at each, in, in each country, I think that, that it's a huge challenge uh, that can have n n some negative results. So this is why I do have mixed feelings. I don't, do not have a proper opinion on it. It's just my, my uh, two cents on, uh, on, on it now, so. I think you know that that is a, it's a perennial challenge, isn't it, for for governments, for research funders about you know what is the the burden of of specific requirements and how do you balance proportionality and burden. So but that's an interesting point about you know whether such certifications you know are useful in that sense. Um, I'm going to pick up, I guess, another point um, before I come back to another round of discussion. It is everybody's talked about? I guess Rochelle talked about evaluation of good quality plans, um, and also people have talked about the training they're doing um, for their committees and their, you know, their, their kind of evaluators. Um, and something that's often challenged around training is how do you test the impact of your training? Um, we had a useful discussion yesterday about impact. You know, research funders always look for impact. Um, and researchers are looking at the impact. So I don't know whether you've all thought about, you know, you, um, I think you actually talked about training the trainer, um, you know, we, we talked about different training programs you have. How do you measure whether this training is, is working on your evaluators or your committees? Astrid? Yeah. Well, I, I just explained that we are at the moment training 
all our policy officers. And what we also do is um, organize an intervention network. So we make sure that the, that the policy offers get the, uh, the, the possibility to share their uh, experiences with other policy officers. And I think that especially in the beginning, that is very important because it, it won't be trained them, but it will be quite difficult to really intervene if you are in a committee um, meeting as a secretary and you see something happens and how do you intervene in a way that in a subtle way that the, the group will actually change uh, the behavior or you, of their own individual will change behavior. So I'm, I'm quite sure that that our policy officer will experience, um, well, will be in, in many different settings and to organize intervention is one way, uh, but we also, um, we just talked about it yesterday, we are going to evaluate um, the experiences also in a more structured way. And we think also of uh, adding an, um, uh, a reviewer or somebody who is in the meeting, who is only looking at what's going on on, uh, inclus on, on inclusion in uh, inclusive culture and things like that. So we, yeah, I think evaluation, uh, plan, do, check, act is really important. And it has to be done in a qualitative way because it's nothing that you can really measure, uh, I guess, in a uh, quantitative way. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to, I think, move, move on to the second part of our discussion, which was about new and emerging actions uh, for research funders. Um, and I guess your reflection on topics that research funders need to focus on, how research funders could benefit from the cooperation across the era through the community of practice. And, and actually, I might turn to Moa here first, if that's OK. Moa, I think you talked a little bit earlier about um, Sex and gender analysis in research and that kind of um, in, in the kind of innovation, um, and, and I think you were the only kind of research funder who's kind of really touched upon that. Um, could I? Could we have your initial thoughts about you know, kind of emerging areas for for RFOs? Um, yes, sure. So um, we have this mandatory question uh, in Venova where we ask our projects if there are any sex and or gender aspects relevant to the project solutions impacts and effects that should be taken into account in the project. So they need to answer yes or no, and they need to motivate the answer. And uh, regarding, um, I mean, we, we finance researchers and universities. So this is a quite an academic question. This is what we learned from our evaluation from, from the answers of the question. So they don't have really a problem um, to answer the question. They can, they can often see um, the, the relevance of this question and how they need to think about gender equality within the project and, and uh, the aims they have. But when we have other actors, they tend to answer more regarding um, the project team and the gender equality of team members. And that is not the same thing, um, that is not connected to the problem area or the, the result of the, the project or the research. So here we, we see um, a big need of how to to um, ask the question maybe in another way, but also to, to be closer to our applicants uh, in teaching, not just our um, committees doing the, the, the reviewing of the answers, but also the, the ones applying. So we need to work closer to universities. We need to work closer to um, the, uh, yeah, the startup scene that also apply for funding at Vinova, but also the civil society. So, I mean, this is, this is a much more broader question uh, and, and it's not just about how to ask the question. Um, and I think that one of the, the most valuable things is, is these kind of collaborations where we can work internationally, um, but also to, to see um, how can we show the importance and the effects? How can we give examples of why it's so important to integrate this in research? And we have been at Vinova, we have been funding, um, instead of funding prototypes, we have been funding uh, prototypes that are projects that are trying to provoke in showing um, if, you, if you are not design, designing uh, um, products or services for, for, for a non-critical perspective, 
then uh, you will leave a lot of people in the society behind by doing so. So that is maybe a, bit, a better example or a better way in, in starting the discussion to, to show this, but it's, it's, it's always hard. Um, but that was also something that we could see in, in the Forgian work um, when we asked the other uh, funding agencies um, that they have the same problem with the question and the application phase and the, the evaluation that how should we understand the answers? What is a good answer to a question like that? Um, and uh, what should be our, so to say, level of, of acceptance? Because uh, if you would ask maybe um, an institution uh, that are focusing only on gender equality, where everyone is gender experts, maybe they would say that the answers that we get in from Vinova is not enough. It's not uh, the, the level that they would accept. But what is our role here uh, as an innovation uh, funding agency? What can we accept? So um, I think um, it, it's, uh, again, as I said before, we need to continue uh, uh, despite progress. Uh, we need continued efforts. Continued efforts are needed, and we need to, to strengthen the ownership mandate and budgets regarding these questions at our funding agencies. Thanks, thanks. Uh, the prototypes, I like that. I, I love that phrase. Um, and it also kind of reflects our discussion yesterday about um, in how do we create change on gender equality in the public sector as well as the private sector. And I think with something like Vinova, where you do fund startups, you know, you are influencing you know, kind of the private sector part of, of, of it as well. So it's a really interesting role, I guess, if you, your research funders also fund, you know, the kind of private sector um, mm. agencies. So that, that's really interesting. So thank you for that perspective. Um, Reda, I'm going to come back to you now, uh, if I may, and uh, just to think about your kind of new and emerging areas from your perspective. We, uh, I mean, uh, in new European era, actions are very important for Latin and I think for all of our members. And uh, as we know, it's uh, one of action plan is support member states uh, that are below AU average level of research and innovation investment to increase the investments um, more than uh, 50 percent in the next five years. So last year research last year's uh, um, research council of Lithuania is facing a challenge related to budgeting deficiently which generally caused a very low um, success rate and uh, we think that uh, all uh, mobility of researchers uh, are very important for us too. So among all other member states, um, are very important too. So I think uh, it's uh, Research Council of Lithuania encourage and applies high standards and uh, good scientific parties practice in research. And we therefore consider a healthy equilibrium between bottom uh, up and bottom down funding approach necessary in line with the freedom of scientific research. So, in case. Thank, thanks for that. And, and yeah, bottom up, bottom down approaches. I think you know yesterday we talked a lot about how you know the kind of bottom up, bottom up that approaches to, to gender equality across you know across member states. So really interesting to kind of bring those two those two together. Um, as well. Um, Rochelle, can I come to you about your thoughts? Yeah, I could talk a lot about a lot of different things, but I thought maybe talking about how to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the effects on researchers just might be a nice a nice single topic. Um, like throughout Forgen, we've been discussing this, but also in Science Foundation Ireland, we're thinking about how to do this on the ground. And I think that the key to, I guess, if we're trying to mitigate um, some of the challenges our researchers had from an equality, diversity and inclusion perspective during the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to think about how we're evaluating people. And um, if we're thinking about how we're changing the way to evaluate people, we tended to use productivity in the past. So how many papers over how many years? And, and maybe we need to move from that kind of productivity type of evaluation to kind of key achievements where we, we take time out of the equation. So if people did lose time during the pandemic, and this is gonna affect researchers for, for many years, you know, because it, this was, it's quite a long, um, it's quite a long time period that that's, um, it's probably gonna be two years, you know, before things go really back to normal. Um, so we need to think about this moving forward, um, not just right now. 
So we're thinking about how to do that in SFI. We've introduced a new narrative CV that's like DORA compliant using the principles of DORA. The idea is to look at key achievements of, of researchers, not just uh, publications or H-index. We've been implementing DORA for uh, the DORA principles for a while, but this is our, our, our latest iteration. Um, the idea is to look at a wide breadth of achievements. So, you know, uh, contributions to the development of knowledge, not just publications, but maybe open access data sets or uh, patents and those sorts of things. The contribution to society and the economy. So what kind of impacts they've had in the past and what achievements they had in the, in, for, for working for society and the economy. Uh, what what uh, achieve, key achievements have, they, have our researchers had in developing individuals? Mentorship, um, you know, working on uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion within their own research group. Um, contributions to uh, the greater research community. So what type of um, work and achievements have they done in that? And this kind of, this, this widens the definition of excellence of research to not just be about, you know, producing papers, but producing excellent individuals, impactful research, a really well-rounded type. And we think this will help uh, complement the work in mitigating all the, the bias that could occur because of the pandemic. And we think it's a nice way to, to implement something that, um, that might help with this. Another thing we're looking at um, when we're looking at the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is moving from looking, you know, to, to reporting research, uh, a researcher's PhD and how much they've achieved in that time, but to actually focus on research active years where you take away, you know, the time when you're, when you're presenting the, uh, the, the amount of years a researcher has been working to the reviewer, you take away all their time that they've had for interruptions such as the COVID-19 pandemic or, you know, uh, maybe they've taken a break in industry and they weren't research active. Perhaps they had a, a couple of maternity or paternity leaves that need to be included. And, and by giving the reviewers just a number instead of the detail of all of the different leaves and why, you're, you're hopefully removing that bias. So those are just some thoughts about what we're thinking about for the future, how we might adapt to, uh, to mitigate some of these issues to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I, I think, you know, talking about COVID-19, I think that's, that's very timely. I think, you know, what, what, as we all think about what returning to, to whatever new normal is, you know, we should be looking at, you know, should we return to the ways we were before? Or actually, have we learned new ways of working that are, are better, that, that have gender, you know, gender built into them? Um, it's interesting what you talked about in terms of, you know, mobility, career breaks, you know, how do we start to address some of these things so that we're not looking at that linear careers, which is very much the, the kind of very academic kind of research, you know, focus which has been you know, in the past. Um, Marius, can I come to you next for your thoughts, please? Yes, so thank you. Um, just to add, I think what Rochelle said was, uh, was exactly what uh, we are trying to do now. And, and I'm actually looking also, because my, my expertise is more on uh, uh, innovative startups, uh, we usually look uh, at the team, you know, what drives the team? What is the team's passion? Can they uh, pivot? Can they change? Can they be coachable? Which is actually more important than they have in an actual entrepreneurial experience before that <laughs> so results because uh, they should be able to have the chance to prove themselves. So I think uh, this is great. And I, I would actually love to see all the evaluation criteria shift from you know, published papers to uh, as a results, it, uh, actual results and that we, we can we can see a touch field, no, that, that's the real impact. Now, go, go, going back to your question, so we, we are actually very active in the um, Iranian scene in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So we do have different concerns regarding, uh, you know, how other uh, research funding organization that we collaborate with around Europe, when we're trying to jointly fund different projects and how they can, how can we together have the same vision on the gender equality issue? Uh, and this uh, will be probably soon uh, a challenge that we will all have to tackle in, in some way or another. And, and I think that 
having these discussions and having these meetings will, will help us uh, creating the trust that we need uh, to be able to um, you know, create a seamless experience for our stakeholders because they will be affected in the end about our, you know, our decision will definitely impact the research funding in, in the next period. And how, uh, I, I, this is still an open question, how can we do that? So this is my, my thoughts on, on, on this subject. I think I was on mute there. <laughs> so, that, thanks, Marius, for that. I think, you know, I think it's interesting you talked about, you know, what drives teams, what, you know, what, you know, how can you, how can we develop researchers rather than always thinking about published papers, you know, what people have done in the past. I, I really like that kind of idea of thinking ahead the future rather than, you know, always looking backwards, you know, and thinking about real impact. So that, thank you for those thoughts. Uh, and Enrique, can I come to you? Yeah. Well, we, um, for the future, the first thing we need to do is to move our gender analysis from a strategic informal group into a gender equality unit. And we haven't done it so, but uh, that should be ready in a couple of years. Um, then being a science funding organization, we need to, we're, we're currently using uh, the scientific method to analyze some of our measures. Um, and for instance, we are currently using, in cooperation with, uh, with uh, social scientists, we are using the scientific method to analyze gender bias in the evaluation committees and in the individual experts. And this is a very interesting, this is a very interesting analysis we're running because we, we commonly see that the success rate is a bit higher for men than for women. And we're trying to deepen into why this happens, right? And there's a number of reasons for that could lead to this result. And of course, gender bias is one of the candidates and we're trying to deepen into this. We are also um, uh, planning at this time to use the scientific system to explore two additional units we're using for gender, uh, policies we're using for gender equality, the temporary interruption of research activities in our doctoral and postdoctoral grants. We need to know what the effect is of this temporary interruption to see if they're contributing or how much they're contributing to gender equality. And, and also uh, the same for the extension period in uh, the extension in the period to document scientific merit in our curricula, right? For instance, if there's been a maternity paternity leave, we increase say one year in this period when uh, for which uh, scientists need to document merit in order to apply for a grant, right? So we need to analyze if, if that um, extension of the period is having the, 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 the effect that we have designed it for. And then um, we need to um, structure gender equality into a total quality approach to scientific evaluation. Uh, in this total quality, we're currently including, uh, in addition to gender equality, research integrity, um, the management of conflicts of interest, and of course, overcoming bibliometry through, through the DORA uh, approach, for instance. So, so uh, there's a whole package of elements that we need to improve in order to achieve um, better quality in our evaluation and, and, and in our granting. And of course, gender equality is a key uh, aspect of this total quality approach. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, Eric, I'll, I'll get a total quality question. You talked about DORA there as well. I think it's all research funders start to think about DORA and, and how, you know, how it's implemented. I, th I think we will see some real traction around gender equality. Astrid, may I come to you um, now? Again, I, I do see lots of overlap with what the others are, are doing. Um, and again, I would like to just pinpoint a few aspects, uh, activities of NWO. I think, uh, first of all, it's uh, good to mention that in the Netherlands, the RFO, uh, together with, uh, with NWO and some other parties, have introduced uh, a plan called uh, uh, reward and what is it recognition and reward, and this is a plan um, to 
to get an to let's say to change the culture uh, and, and the, 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 the system, the academic, academic, academic system, sorry, uh, and to get diversification in career paths. So it, that a researcher uh, doesn't necessarily have to be and uh, a good board member and a good researcher and a good teacher and a good leader and a good manager. So that the people have different ways in which they can develop. And together, again, of course, that will uh, supply diversity because then uh, at a higher level, uh, people will have uh, diverse uh, cap capabilities, uh, cap competences, sorry. I need to talk a little bit slower. <laughs> um, so this plan, it's called uh, recognition and reward. Maybe for, for you, it be, can be inspirational to look at the, the way uh, we, plan to do it in the Netherlands, let's say. Uh, so but it's, that's already published, so this is not about the future. Uh, and the thing I would like to address is communication. We are now about to think about um, communication, uh, as communication is, in our view, more and more important. We see in the, in the academic culture, um, well, woke activism, uh, words that cannot be used anymore, which can cause a lot of resistance. Also resistance when people are not uh, allowed to use words. So we need a uh, new focu oh, vocabulary, new words. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, uh, vogue activism has come from the United States. But of course, our cultural identity is, is different from what's happening in the United States. We have a different history and that we don't have the words, the right words yet to express ourselves. And it's quite explosive as you all read the papers. So we look at communication in, in that sense, uh, how it's used in social media and how we can find the nuance to, to meet each other again. So in that way, uh, intimidation, harassment, activism, uh, language is very important. So we look at that. And then also in, uh, for, yeah, we organize evaluation committee meetings. And we also look into language, uh, inclusive language. How can we prevent silencing? So how can you make sure that everybody feels the, the room to speak up and to speak out uh, and also well, I'm not a native English speaker, and um, but we, most of our meetings are done in a language which is not the, the mother tongue of the members. And that can also be, language is so important if you really want to understand each other. So we, we're also going to look into how can we make sure that the main language which is used in the meeting is the language all of the members speak at a good enough level, things like that. So language. Uh, also, uh, we, we look at uh, ways to make sure that people with, uh, for instance, hearing problems or people who can't see, that they can uh, join in in an appropriate way. So it's all about communication. And also, which I, what I already mentioned is how do you communicate as a police, policy officer in a meeting in a way that you can influence the people, the group dynamic, the way that the culture stays inclusive. So this, it's all about communication and all, also how we communicate our message within our organization and how we can make sure that all our employees are going to be ambassadors of our diversity inclusion policy. So a communication is a, is a big topic now for us. So, and then uh, towards uh, target groups, we uh, uh, understand more and more that it's all about uh, what's really important is first generation students and um, uh, researchers who come from a background from, with a low social economic status. So we, we're going to try and see how we can understand that better. And, and at the same time, move away from target groups uh, to move away from identity politics to stay out of the, yeah, the danger area a bit but really focus on the exclusion mechanisms behind um, which we try to target. So we try to understand that even better, especially now that identity becomes more and more important, but also sometimes in a way that we don't think it's uh, constructive, good for, for the inclusive culture. 
So I think that uh, those two points uh, I would like to uh, put on the table here. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, a really interesting you talked about, you know, can, a, a, a disabled people and actually how do we engage them? I, I, I like the fact that we're thinking about the kind of broader diversity. You know, one of the first things I had to do in lockdown was to work with our Disabled Students Commission here in the UK. And we had to have Zoom meetings. I had to learn so much about, you know, we had two sign language inter interpreters captioning working out that, you know, students who are neurodiverse found it very hard to follow the chat and follow the screen. So how do we integrate all that? How do we learn from all of that? So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that kind of broad diversity. I'm going to ask one quick final question because I have two minutes left, but that question has come up in the chat a, a number of times. Um, and that is that in terms of, it's great to see all the work that research funders are doing, um, but we often see that women in universities are given heavier teaching loads, are uh, you know, asked to do more pastoral care, not encouraged to apply for research. So really, we're excluding a whole group of, of, of women who are not encouraged, I suppose, or you know, put forward to, do, to, to, to apply for research. Um, I, I guess a really quick question from the final thoughts really is what can research funders do to try and reach these people who are not encouraged to apply because of the way institutional research culture um, excludes them. Uh, Rochelle, I think your mic's can, just gone on, so yeah. I can start. Um, well, I think there's a, a few things that we can do. One of the things is to try to change the culture in the institutions by making you know, some mandatory eligibility criteria of a gender equality action plan that's going to be monitored for impact. That's one, one way we can reach in. Um, another way you could reach in is actually to um, incentivize the universities to find uh, applicants from minority groups. So we, we did this in one of our calls um, a, a number of years ago. Uh, it was a call called our, our starting investigator grant. So we found that there were um, only 20% women applying, but we know that the postdocs, which is the applicant pool, are about 50% women. So that, that was an issue. Um, how we made a specific action to address that. We, we, in the original call, you could have six applicants from each institution. With the gender action, you were allowed six applicants from each in institution, and only six of them could be men. So when we, when we brought this to the universities, we found that it, we changed from about 20% application to women, of women to 50%. And in that way, we encourage the universities to put forward these, uh, these applicants. You know, we encourage them to find the, gr the great women within their universities to put forward. And actually the success rates were then, um, you know, we had about 50-50 uh, men and women in, in the awards as well. So we moved from about 20% to 50% and we thought that really good impact. So there are ways to do it, not just culture. Um, I don't see anybody else's mic on, so it, and it's now 11 o'clock Central European time. So um, thank you for uh, to, to my panel really for talking about all the great work you're doing. You know, in your different funding uh, research funding organisations. You know, how you're encouraging real thinking and change in terms of gender equality, learning from each other. I think you know, as as you know, we're always learning, and, and I've learned so much today, and so many new ideas. Uh, and thank you, Rochelle, for talking about the forging community of practice as well. I, I think, you know, as research funders, um, it, it sounds fantastic to bring, bring together, to kind of continue the shared learning, shared discussion, dialogue. Uh, I really look forward to hearing more about how that progresses. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, having been involved in the ACT project as well, it's great to see, you know, the kind of impact and outcome of it. So um, thank you to my panelists for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we're now going to go into a break. We have a half, a half an hour break um, and then the conference resumes at 11.30 Central European time for our final panel discussion for the conference. Um, thank you very much.